so as first, just as we should, we'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. So Sengage Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of the lands of all First Nations people of Australia. We pay respect to their elders past and present. We recognise the continuing connection of First Nations peoples to the land, air and waters, and thank them for protecting these lands, waters and ecosystems since time immemorial. Now, just a little bit of housekeeping to kick off. Um, this webinar is being recorded and the video and slides will be sent out um, either later this week or early next week to everyone who registered. So don't worry if you miss something or you see a link or you see something you'd like to see later, we'll get a chance. Please put any questions you have in, um, in the Q&A. You can feel free to comments, share links or anything else in the chat. Um, and we also will be using Jamboard this evening. So a link will be shared in the chat for that. And if you have any questions at any point, please contact us at os.secondary at cengage.com.au for any post-event things. And now I'm going to hand over to our science publisher, Catherine Healy, and she'll take over. Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm today we're we're really lucky um, to have speak to us, Joe Sanbono. So Joe has is a jingly man. Um, many of you may have heard of him before. He is a curriculum specialist and he specialises in embedding First Nations Australian histories and cultures across the Australian education sectors. This is from primary to tertiary. He started his career as a zoologist um, and later merged his interests in biology and his background in um, cultural, um, his cultural background in the career in secondary education. So he, Joe previously led curriculum projects at CSIRO and also at ACARA. Um, and currently he's the program lead for enhancing First Nation Australians perspectives at the University of Queensland in, sorry, Univ sorry Queensland University of Technology, so QUT. Um, so we were really lucky. And the reason why um, Joe is speaking with you today is that um, he's been, Joe's been working with us at Nelson um, to help in that production of a new textbook series that we are um, in the stages of finalising, so known as Nelson Science. And um, he's been, so Joe's role in this project is our, what we're calling our First Nations Australian Curriculum Specialist for this series. So if you look at that um, at roadmap there on the right, you'll see that Joe has been with us from the beginning and um, he's been involved in the sourcing of authors, development of content, planning of content, writing of content, review of content. Um, and we're at that very exciting stage at the end of the road where we're now able to start talking about these fantastic materials with, um, with the teachers across Australia. So I'm going to um, stop talking and I'm going to hand over to Joe, who is going to be sharing his um, expertise with you today. Thanks, Joe. No worries. Thank you. Um, thanks, Catherine. Thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, coming. I think we had uh, something like over 120 people uh, registered, which is which is exciting, and it's good to hear that there's such uh, interest in, in these things. Um, I'm coming to you today from um, uh, in Logan, uh, south side of Brisbane, um, just out of Beenleigh, and I'm on uh, Guggenjin country, so I always uh, acknowledge um, Guggenjin peoples as the, as the traditional owners of the land I'm on. Um, but yeah, so thank you for the introduction. And and um, a lot of this probably builds off of uh, a lot of the work I've done working from the, I guess, the um, inception of the Australian curriculum and then also trying to um, support um, different jurisdictions and the implementation of the cross-curriculum priorities, in particular our priority. So it's 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 valuable to probably start with some of the, the um, key terms that we are using in this, in this resource and in these materials and to give you some sort of uh, background to that. Um, unfortunately, some of the key terms can be confusing sometimes, but with a little bit of research, it's um, more often than not we find people are, are, are very happy to hear this. They're quite straightforward. So one of them is obviously First Nations Australians. We're seeing that changing, um, uh, you know, throughout the nation, if we want to say. Uh, we're seeing that term and it being more and more embraced in uh, our everyday way that we refer uh, to these greater collectives of what we would formally say and what we still can say is Indigenous uh, peoples of Australia. So in this case, it's, um, you know, people like myself prefer the term because um, it, it's about saying that this first, this idea that we are here prior to, to colonisation. Um, and it also makes the point that um, 
uh, you know, that push back against things like terra nullius, that we were not civilised people and nations, that we actually were uh, and are comprised of it. Uh, the, uh, the Australian continent is comprised of a diverse group of nations. So that's the rationale behind First Nations Australians. Peoples and nations you'll see used in plural form. And, and again, that's because we're not one uh, group of people. Um, culturally, we're, we're, we're very diverse, way more, way more diverse than, than even Europe. Um, and unfortunately, it's one of the things we're trying to uh, address in, in our uh, education of, of Australians for future generations is to recognise and respect that cultural diversity. And you can imagine um, First Nations peoples from uh, North, North Queensland, for instance, from the rainforest areas, say the, the, what we broadly call the Mamu people, uh, are vastly different culturally to people from some of our uh, central desert regions. Uh, and country and place, again, is, is understanding that these are the spaces mapped out, that for many of us uh, peoples, we occupy and regard them as our own. And we often have um, you know, responsibility to caring for these places. And we have very deep, uh, long-held spiritual connections uh, to them. And these includes you know, lands, uh, uh, waters, and, and including the sky. So thanks, Catherine. I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, oh, the, other, the other term that we'll see is cultural narrative. Um, for most of us in education, we would have all grown up hearing the terms um, uh, myths or fables and, and things like that, or just even the word stories. Um, what we're finding is that a lot of our communities, uh, um, you know, really, really uh, um, have fought for a long time to, to make a statement that a lot of our, a lot of our narratives, uh, are, I guess, encoded and carry a lot of our uh, learning a lot of our uh, knowledge and, and a lot of our histories and it's not just a, a um, bedside uh, story that we tell our kids to, to get them to go to sleep so it's so a cultural narrative again you know is more uh, you know is a term that that encompasses that that uh, importance and diversity of what's within them and you'll even see in, in some of the stuff Catherine will discuss with you uh, later that that cultural narratives are quite important in, in science these days and we're seeing uh, diverse groups of scientists now exploring cultural narratives for the, uh, um, the, the, the scientific knowledge that is, is held in a lot of them. So, yeah. Yeah, um, do I let you, Catherine, you're going to explain this bit, aren't you? Yes, so um, if just, so in the, in the chat, there'll be a link to the Jamboard. Um, and before we kind of, we, we jump in any further, we just wanted to hear from you what you hope um, to get out of this session today. Because I think it's always, um, yeah, and I think sometimes we, so we've done a, a few points where we're going to be asking you questions just to kind of um, get a bit more interactivity and just to hear, hear from you and hear about your experiences. So I'm just going to jump out of here for a sec. And... Yeah, so if you just jump on the Jamboard there and um, as you type as you type into the Jamboard, there's the option here to click on a little sticky note. So you can just click on that and you can write your um, write what you what, what you'd like to get out today and it will appear in the up here on the session. So if you just want to on the session on this board rather. So hopefully everyone can see the link in the chat. And if you have any IT issues, let us know. Is that working? It's normally it would be popping up here. Catherine, can you please give us uh, like share access? Oh, should, okay, sorry. That's cool. Bear with me, that is weird. It should have already done that. Um, okay. I've already, that is very weird. Okay. So it should already be done, should have already done that. Anyone with the link? Done. Is that working now? If it's not, we might just leave it and we'll jump to the next one because I don't want to get bogged down in this. We might just, we'll come back to this, I think. Um, Okay, so sorry about that. Sometimes technology doesn't behave very well. So, um, Joe, if I can pass back to you, please. Yep, 
no worries. Um, yeah, so so yeah, we can from here on we can we can start having a look at the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So we've got a type there. Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures cross Britain priorities in the Australian curriculum. Um, obviously, this is uh, a role that I held for um, uh, for four years, and uh, I was at up until most recently during the um, most recent review. Um, yes, yeah, so we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so so we're going to look at um, version eight point four. Obviously, we know there's um, the version nine. But um, when I started my uh, role then, I guess why I, I went there was, was I had a long interest in um, probably uh, even 8.4 and before 8.4, uh, there was only about 13 um, inclusions for our uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander histories and cultures cross critical priority. And that was spread across 11 years of learning from, from prep to year 10, <coughs> excuse me. So we were, we were well, I was, I was very interested in, in, in um, Sort of unpacking why it was when the Australian curriculum was released that it had have such minimal inclusion in science, which seemingly is a, a learning area that would have such a great um, alignment uh, to our ways of knowing, being, and doing. Um, so, out of that um, review, we, we did some lobbying and, and worked with some others uh, in in the field, uh, people like um, RDK Price and Professor Peter Buckskin, and so on. We were able to lobby the ACARA board and have them revisit this and. I was given the task of leading that uh, what we we end up calling a refinement of 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 the um, P to ten or F to ten uh, science curriculum, and through that refinement, we were able to add um, now I think I think at the end there's over a hundred uh, content elaborations that are there to provide educators uh, you know the ideas for how they can incorporate the cross curriculum priority in, in science. Um, and that was a, a really welcome sort of uh, celebration. And we also we also were able to convince ACARA to do something that they hadn't done in the past, which was to provide another layer of support. One of the things we do know, and I, we could take a safe bet that you're attending today is because you have a strong desire of knowing more about how to do these things. And you're probably well aware that it can be complex and, and can have what a lot of people perceive as a lot of pitfalls and barriers. So we also uh, quickly recognise that we're all the products of the Australian education system, not all of us, but many of us are products of the Australian education system, or we grew up elsewhere. Um, but a, a function of that is, is um, we don't know much about uh, uh, you know, our country's First Nations peoples. So in, in recognition of that, um, for every included content elaboration, we were able to produce a, a teacher background uh, information um, uh, document that would accompany it and we were able we comp compiled those together and, and published them as, as booklets and down the bottom of this slide you can see two links so foundation of year six is available there and but these were again um, I, I quite I still use these a lot because they they involved some of the writers that are writing for this text at the moment for this new text um, and they they are, are, are very, very valuable documents. We, we worked very hard in the production of them. They went through really rigorous cultural audits and, and edits, and, and uh, we, we really worked hard to ensure that we were giving uh, all of our educators, and especially non-First Nations educators, as much uh, knowledge, information, and support as we can to really put you in that safe lane of where you know it was an appropriate place for you to speak and 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 do and so on so yeah so um yeah you'll see i'll, I'll leave it there and we'll keep going sorry Catherine. um and yeah the important thing is version nine uh, maintained a lot of that hard work look, look, those good things we achieved there there has been some movement some people might argue some you know the, the rearrangement of the deck chairs but, but by and large, they're still there. I think one of the challenges even I have for myself is to uh, acquaint myself with the new website, new Australian curriculum website, and to see how do I actually find them. In the old, in the old version we've produced, there are still existing some, some um, PDF tables and so on that provided hyperlinks and shortcuts to help you um, get through these complex websites. Uh, probably the big thing in year in version nine that was through was a, a shift in what we're now calling inquiry skills. Some of what we were, were called science inquiry skills elaborations have now been elevated into science inquiry content descriptions. And primary they are around uh, the skills that we started recognizing that 21st century scientists don't need to just learn about who we are or know about us. They actually need to start learning how to work with us and collaborate with us in science 
or potentially even see the opportunities of working for us in the generation of new science knowledge. You know, we see things like the um, reinstatement of fire regimes and those sorts of things are a good example of um, our knowledges and and uh, um, contemporary science knowledges coming together to provide a, a contemporary solution and so on. Um, thanks, Catherine. Yeah, so yeah, as as we said, I, I, I hazard a guess that that um, you're all well acquainted with with uh, some of the challenges in, in embedding uh, First Nations context in the science classroom. So I'll just so, yeah. Start, yeah, sorry about the IT issue with that. I think yeah. um, let me just try one more thing here. If that's if everyone wants to bear with me for one sec to see if I can. Um, let's just. Let me just try one more, one more thing. If I can just share this, I think I think I know what what went wrong. So I'm going to try copying link. I'm just going to add this into the chat here. If you want to try this again, so um, I think I'm what I did before was yeah. I don't know what I did before, but hopefully that that has worked. So can anyone is anyone able to jump on? It works. Yay. Great. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, so in this in this one here, we were just if people want to jump in and just type in what are your biggest challenges in teaching the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and cultures cross curriculum priorities in the science classroom. So we'll just give you a minute um, there to type to type your, your challenges, so just use the poster note. All right, so we've got some things popping up there. Um, so people not feeling competent, culturally competent to teach the Indigenous perspectives. Yep. Yep, and a lot of people will agree with that one. Um, yeah, I think not being the expert is a good one. I think, you know, as science teachers, we are experts um, on a topic. And I think there's that feeling that, if, yeah, that fear of getting it wrong. Absolutely. Uh, engaging white students not over talking or talking down to a culture that's not mine. Yeah, that idea of just being the outsider, no, and and, and get, getting it wrong. Right, so feel free to keep dropping those ones in there as we. I'll just jump back to the slide. Great. Joe, over to you. Yeah, so um, I think we'll get a chance to speak to some of those uh, as we go through as well. And I think we're going to naturally uh, cover off on some of them. And the ones given are certainly the ones that uh, um, uh, perpetually show up. I mean, all of the ones you've, you've um, brought forward are, are, are certainly well well known. Uh, you can see the list you know, we had here of being culturally insensitive or causing offence is one that often is cited as freezing people into not doing it, uh, time poor, you know, uh, th it's complex work. It's, it's, there is no um, First Nations uh, uh, Australian chemistry textbook, um, you know, so you know, how do you get the information? So on takes a, a bit of research and it has an impact on time. Um, some, some people are, uh, are citing often that there's a lack of local community connections or even how do they go about forming them and, and so on. Um, issues around fi finding appropriate resources or how to get them, how to access them and so on. Um, and a lot of people, you know, when we did some of that early curriculum work with the elaborations were, were had concerns about the, I guess, the genre that they're written in, um, the, that um, there was always long criticism that um, the content descriptions and content elaborations are written 
in a way that was really open to interpretation. So getting clear on that that link between the science content or skills with our, uh, our cultural context. Um, and just people just completely lost at sea and not even knowing how to even begin on these things. So, so yeah, it's, um, uh, uh, again, all of these things I think um, are well within being uh, addressed. And I, and I hope sort of out of today, you, you see that the sort of resources that they're investing in now address a lot of a lot of those things um but yeah we'll keep we'll keep going i think yep so how does the how does science in our histories and cultures or the aboriginal and torres Strait islander histories and cultures cross curriculum fit together um, um and you know the, the the first thing is uh we, we've got to start with recognizing some of that cultural diversity i, I had mentioned before um <clears throat> one of the one of the um unintended messages that we receive when we see our limited involvement in sciences or recognition in sciences that people are not necessarily valuing or seeing that for uh for our cultures to be here for over 60 uh, plus thousand years it's no fluke that we were able to, to um, care for ourselves and care for the country we lived on and nourish ourselves for such uh, an immense or vast uh, time uh, period. Um, and often what we see is we, we go back and look at some of these things as we, we see an immense amount of knowledge and information uh, that could be aligned to and is well aligned to some of the, the science disciplines that we think of. You know, there's lots of organic chemistry being used there's or inorganic chemistry being used to produce things um there's there's uh, immense ecological knowledge and you're probably all familiar with things like traditional ecological knowledge but we're less familiar with our diverse knowledges around uh, you know physics and so on so um but yeah so really starting with this idea that we've been here for a very long time the there is no wilderness in australia uh we we uh have populated this continent over every single uh, place, you know, of every single climate from, you know, the real temperate zones to, to, to virtually waterless deserts. Um, so yeah, and we, we didn't survive, we thrived, you know, we, we were, and you see this map is, is a really good evidence of, of that uh, and, and so on. Like I said, it was, it's worth thinking about this in terms of Europe and thinking about if we overlaid Europe on the Australian continent, we'd see that the, the Spanish are, culturally and linguistically different to the French and so on. And so in here, each one of those regions is equally as culturally diverse uh, and, and even having, so each of these, I'm sure most of you know this map well, but each one of those colored areas represents a language, a, 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 a different and a specific language that's being spoken in those territories. So um, yeah, it's very, very important. Um, and, and the other thing is coming back to, I guess, where these this resource that we're producing is, is where, where we have kept and, and maintain our uh, a connection to the Australian curriculum, because that's sort of what educators are being asked to implement. And we are still trying to, I guess, support you in, in uh, bringing those one, over 100 connections in the Australian curriculum to life into classrooms where you support you to, to do that uh, and make it happen in, a, in an appropriate manner. Sorry, Catherine. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's really important that um, that people understand that um, the, the, our our goal and desire in this is to improve um, the teaching and learning of science, especially for people of my background. Um, and it's so it should be done in a way, you know, using our cultural uh, context shouldn't shouldn't um, uh, what do you call it. It shouldn't be a diversion from it. it shouldn't derail the teaching and it, it, it actually should be used to as a, to complement and enrich the teaching uh, of it we often hear in curriculum people talk about things like a bloated curriculum and so on if we do this if we do this well and use these contexts you find that you can teach the discipline knowledge and also uh, incorporate these cultural aspects at the same time so um, and we, as science educators, we, we're well versed in, I, I'm a science teacher myself, we're well versed in using context. It's sometimes what it takes us is to, is to uh, learn a, a different context or a context that has cultural uh, meaning. Um, I, I often argue that um, 
you'll find in your classes, and, and you may or may not agree, but a lot of our uh, non-First Nations students have a strong interest in, in this topic. And, and more often than not, that in itself can be uh, an opportunity for, for further and better engagement in the teaching of science. I think it's a, one of the things that's always worried me in, in, in teaching science. I love science. And I think it's the, obviously the best learning area. But we also can be guilty of teaching it in the, in the most abstract and boring way. So I think sometimes context, whether they're cultural or not, can be very uh, powerful in, in engaging our, our learners into learning these mandatory uh, concepts. Um, and yeah, some of these contexts really give you that real life application. You can see what it, what it means. And again, that, that challenge of, I think we have these stereotypical views of who and what is a scientist. And we often think it's a European person, uh, um, you know, in a, in a laboratory wearing a white lab coat. You know, and we just know that that science isn't isn't that bland. You know, um, you can be a you can be an ecologist working on bandicoot somewhere, or, or you could be in a you could be in a lab, but you know, you might be working on um, you know um, traditional pharmacopoeia and trying to find out a, a, a novel uh, antibacterial you know um, compound or something like that. But either way, we we hope that this broadens that idea and and addresses some of that unfortunate deficit knowledge someone made the point in the in the jam board before that how do you how do you deal with these um non-first nation students in your class that starts pulling this apart uh, and unfortunately some of this is about uh exposing students to the richness of uh you know and the, and the complexity of our knowledge as it relates to science i think sometimes that's powerful in having those students uh, hold their views in or, or or just be exposed to that um we're not just primitive Stone Age people. We've got really sophisticated knowledges and so on. Yeah, next. So what are some of the considerations when embedding First Nations context into the science classroom? Um, uh, we've got two key considerations for, for successful embedding. And, and one is uh, improved awareness of what is non-secret open First Nations uh, cultural context and that what are the ones that clearly connect to science and how can we use them to teach these fundamental uh, science concepts. And the other one is, is the one that a lot of educators uh, come to me about is knowing what lane to be in, knowing to, you know, am I, am I causing offence? Am I in the right spot or am I overstepping my mark? And we can do that by improving the clarity about how to embed First Nations histories and cultures appropriately, including uh, understanding the difference between uh, showcasing our, our cultures or or finding yourself inappropriately teaching culture so it's a it's a very it's probably the most i hope out of today maybe something you take away with you is a, a, an idea in your mind that um your your job as a non-first nations educator should be to um you know put a spotlight on our histories and cultures in your classrooms and, and showcase our ways of working scientifically and whatever it may be or explore the science of a particular technology we might have but your job is not to teach our culture that that rests with our um, community and so often i say to people you should always ask yourself am i showcasing another culture's uh, um, context here or am i am i teaching it so but yeah hopefully hopefully um you can you'll see that that there's a that there is a difference there and um although it can be a nuanced difference that it is a very clear it's a very clear difference. I think, I'm not sure if I talk about it here or now, but I'll, I'll bring up one uh, occasion that I, I certainly have seen in my uh, education career is, um, you know, uh, it's not a science, necessarily science related one, but looking at um, teaching of visual arts, for instance, or just looking at yeah, visual arts that you can imagine. Uh, we would love to see educators showcase the diversity of visual arts of First Nations Australians, be it, be it things like dot art that you'd be aware of or, or, or um, petroglyphs or um, dendroglyphs, carvings and trees or whatever it may be um, that we want to see it. But we less likely uh, to appreciate people trying to um, get their students to, to use that visual art style and for the students to learn it and do it and produce it. That would be an example of crossing that line. Um, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> yeah, so uh, 
So uh, what does non-secret, non-sacred mean? I mean, we can also add the word non, uh, non-secret there or non-secret. Sometimes we see it as non-secret slash non-sacred, but it means uh, it's the, the practice knowledge or cultural narrative that is appropriate for everyone to share. And that gives you the uh, authority that you can, as an outsider, uh, talk about it or share it or showcase it in your classroom, you know, whatever that may be. And more often than not, we can see, especially in science, we see a lot of our domestic uh, um, examples or, or domestic things like this utensil here, this um, what we often call a coolerman or a wooden dish. You know, it's, we could, you know, it's open, it's open knowledge. There's no secret or sacred uh, designs carved into that. This is a, a utilitarian bowl. Um, it's often associated with using for separating mixtures, things like winnowing material. You imagine you'd use um, uh, uh, clipped in grains and grinding grains on sandstone. The, 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 the process of doing that puts sand particles into the flour and you grind that off and you put it into a bowl like this and then you would use this bowl to winnow and, and separate the flour from the sand and so on, or even husks or whatever it may be. But my point is that's a very open domestic um, practice and knowledge and technology that um, you would not find yourself in trouble for. Um, you know, if you were trying to explain to your students uh, the importance of separating mixtures and you had junior primary students or something, and you, you could even potentially um, show students, I know I've done this before where I might, um, buy some plastic gold panning dishes and um, buy some parrot bird mix and then I would pour the parrot bird mix into the gold panning and, and get them to actually have a go at winnowing because winnowing is something men and women do it's something that's done by all first nations peoples or just all by humans really so it's a, an example of a, a very open uh, type of uh, example um, Yep, thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and this is probably another uh, another example. You know, we, we talk about in, in science, we might look at lunar cycles and one of the contexts we can explore the lunar cycles is, is uh, tidal fish traps. And this photo shows you a, a, a tidal fish trap that's at low tide, obviously. Um, and, you know, these, uh, you know, uh, are a good context to get students to start exploring how humans have long been using lunar cycles and understand lunar cycles and how many tides a day and so on uh, in this technology. Um, these are in the public domain, they're not secrets. You know, men, women, children would go to these. Even today, you can still around a lot of the coastline of Australia, they're still, some are still very much in operation. And very often, some of the ones uh, I go to have interpretive signs with them and often uh, written by the respective traditional owners, explaining what their name for them is, how they worked, what they were hunting in that particular occasion, and so on. So it's just really safe, open uh, knowledge. Thanks, Carol. Um, yeah. So uh, the 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 and going back to uh, the the point about the cross and priority and where a lot of educators will will get confused is uh, the the idea of the cultural context is to support the teaching of the science concept the, the goal is not to teach the culture the goal is to use it to uh, teach the science concept so in here in this uh, in this case here we've got a traditional fire lighting technology a, a drill stick and a half stick the, the bottom piece and um you know it's a really good way you can you can look at uh, um, friction or combustion or in this case energy transformation we can see how you can take uh, the, the um, movement energy and you can convert it into through friction into heat energy and produce that um, glowing ember so the 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 piece here we want to we want to see is the the um the, the teaching of the science of this idea of energy transformations we want to make that more interesting to students when i learned some of this in school i remember a, a, a teacher told me rub your hands together really hard <laughs> and that was sort of you know th that was the way or, or I think we had one on the brakes on a bus or something like that uh, read a paragraph from a textbook <laughs> what I what I'm suggesting in these sorts of cases is to where possible we can often give students a chance to either watch someone use a traditional fire lighting technique or at times we can even get uh, uh, replicas of these that we can purchase that are appropriate for students to not light fire but to you know, uh, use it to produce smoke, for instance. 
but the, the the point here is it, it becomes the vehicle for teaching of the, of the science, mandatory science concept, and that that's what we're assessing. It's what the Australian curriculum is asking you to assess. It doesn't ask you to assess the the the, the cultural components of of this. But in doing so, if we do this successfully, you'll you'll address the two perpetual commitments that are in all of the education declarations since they started. Uh, I think at Hobart. Um, Adelaide, Melbourne, and now uh, the Mbandua Education Declaration, you'll see that they always commit, all ministers keep maintaining their commitment to ensuring that um, we see ourselves in our in the curriculum that we are taught to so we can uh, improve our, our identity and see our value in it and, and uh, hopefully improve our connection with, with contemporary education. Um, and the other part is ensuring as a nation, all students you know, go away knowing from so in this case we learn that we learn about the um we're learning about the energy transformation and in in doing that as a as a positive byproduct and almost an enrichment to it is you've also you've also uh, learned about our fire lighting technologies and our non-first nation students you know we hope are impressed about the diversity of our technologies and the efficiency of a lot of the you can look at these and you'll learn that people could light a fire from from nothing to flame in under 30 seconds so you know it's quite good technology anyway we'll keep going i better be careful catherine on time too so don't be sure to jump in um so what do we mean by inappropriate teaching of cultural contexts um so again it's it's confusing that idea of teaching culture and and, and not the science of the cultural practice it's something uh, it's one we I've seen a few times in use of looking people investigating the physics of spear throwers, you know, what we often call woomeras. And um, it's perfectly fine to look at well, what's the what's the physics that underpins the use of the woomera, what's the lever class and how does it work as a moment arm and all of these things that are connected and, and there in that mandatory elements of the Australian curriculum. But where sometimes I've seen it go astray is where educators might ask students to make a replica spear thrower, including doing particular designs burnt into it, and then going out on a field and teaching students how to throw a spear with it and assessing them on that. It's one of those clear cases where um, we have overstepped our mark and we're teaching culture uh, and we're teaching uh, how to make this cultural technology and how to use it. So that's that's a, a, a good example of, of um, not showcasing our culture, but but actually um, teaching it. And hopefully, if I get time, to hurry up. I can show you an example of that of doing that in a in a more culturally appropriate way. Um, and um, the other the other the other uh, one that we often see is using content or information that is secret or sacred. Um, and that that seem, these these days it seems to be less and less. People get you know usually um, a bit more sort of uh, astute at recognizing it i would always say to people if it involves ceremony avoid it you know if, the, if it has a word in it that says ceremony then you should really look at it uh, quite quite skeptically um you know uh teaching sorry did you speed me up catherine <laughs> um sorry joe yes i didn't mean to. Yeah, yeah. um so here it's more about the instead of exploring the science of you know how is a particular uh, um, I guess chemical process occurring. What's happening in a in a in a food processing, a toxic food processing procedure? How is that occurring? If we look at the actual steps involved and how long something is done, then really we're 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 we're, we're on the inside of someone's knowledge. We're looking at their recipe almost. And you think for your own families, how much people would stick to not sharing their their recipes, but. Broadly, if we want to look at some of the productions of food, for instance, especially detoxification, it gives a really good opportunity to explore the chemistry of it. But you might only look at, you know, what's occurring from the point of view of using water to separate, you know, to cleave a particular compound, you know, hydrolysis or something. The other, the other one, as I said, ceremonies, the other ones are, you know, start to explore the real detail of funerary or mortuary practices or initiation practice. These are all the ones that, Normally, we'll get people in hot water, and again, I think we're, we're pretty good these days. I think we we know, we we seem to really sense that we maybe we are overstepping the mark. But again, 
my big advice here is if it's ceremonial um, or down to the to the instructions on how to do something, then you've got to ask yourself: Should I be should I be sharing that information with others? That from you know. Thank you. Sorry, Catherine. Um, so what do we mean by, uh, oh, so yeah, continued. So retelling, it's it's one of the ones that even in the production of this work here, we, ha we had to check out ourselves with, especially when you're looking at cultural narratives and educators will quite often, um, um, quite often find themselves guilty of retelling someone else's uh, cultural narrative, be it a dreaming story or something like that. It's a big, it's a big no-no. Um, and, and doing so is a form of, is a direct form of appropriation. Um, you know, uh, we, we, they're very, they're very important in, in um, as context for students to look at and for them to, to approach it or take a lens or apply a lens to it where they're looking at the, the science within some of these narratives. We can often find some of these narratives that are out in the public domain um, that might describe events from the past like volcanoes or earthquakes and we can explore you know, what's the geological processes in, in them, but we shouldn't, you know, use them to start retelling these stories or, or so on or trying to make sense, trying to make sense of them. Um, so to protect the cultural integrity of these accounts, it's important that we, we don't retell them. And the big problem there is we, we and it's in the um, literature about the embedding of cross group priorities that educators often do this and when they do so they often misinterpret or misrepresent what was going on or, or pull it apart till it's too simplistic you know including just looking at the science of it for instance can be seen as a um, as a criticism so instead we want to highlight the science within the narratives um, that are authored by the respective peoples and that are in the public domain and that's a little test you can often do yourself you can do a quick search to say well who's telling the story that i'm exploring is it available? Has it been published in the last 10 years, for instance? Can I get a hold of it? And, and is it being told by someone from that cultural uh, entity? Thanks, Catherine. Um, what have we got here? Uh, yeah, so making sure we're not just being extractive and taking cultural information from wherever we find it without seeing information, uh, permission, sorry. Uh, educators, we're guilty of this all the time. We, we, I know I did it in my life as an educator. Uh, I, I would grab images and, and so on and use them. And I mean, we know that that's problematic in terms of copyright. We often understand that we can possibly get away with it more because we have there is some leniency in, in the Copyright Act. But when it comes to cultural things, then it can get us in hot water because we, we often uh, what we're doing is going into old secondary sources, old books. You know, especially that have been published over 20 years ago, um, you, you'll find that the type of cultural responsiveness or respect, like, you know, the, in the production of this material, wasn't given back then. And there's not always clear permission or support from the respective people who are being depicted, or even the attributions are often uh, uh, filled with errors or no attributions at all. Um, so, yeah, be very, be very, very careful, is uh, my advice. Um, and uh, getting the okay to, to use it, just because you get permission to use something, um, people take that as an eternal license and they can use it any way they see fit. My advice to people, if you seek permission to take a photo of something and use it, um, you'd be very specific about how it's going to be used. And if you want to use it again, you return to that to that in person for, for um, permission again. I've had it before. I've given um, images of traditional hunting uh, of, of particular things, I think turtles or something one time. And, and then um, uh, I found that that image was then used uh, in, a, in a negative article about traditional hunting rights. And there it has my name, you know, and you imagine my family were like, well, why are you having a go at us for, you know, you, you, you eat this, you know. So, yeah, we've got to be very careful where things end up. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, and making sure we're not, um, we're, we're not masking cultural diversity. Remember that map with all of those different languages spoken? Um, we've got to avoid making these sweeping generalizations uh, about uh, who we are as, and our practices and so on. Um, you know, we often see this, um, we'll say, oh, the rainbow serpent or something like that. Well, um, there is a familiarity there with, with this large 
um, serpent, but it, it has a very specific name in each different uh, cultural uh, group and so on. And, and we've got to do better. We've got to do better in this. And we've often seen, you know, these big sweeping generalizations like, you know, first nation has used spear trails. Well, it's not exactly true. Here where I'm in Brisbane, people were not using spear trails, you know, and they have other technologies that, you know, or uh, there's reasons as to why they're not being used. But yeah, thank you. So what are some approaches to embedding First Nations context? Um, yeah, and I, I wanted to make the point that um, I think there's an unfortunate uh, um, mindset that's growing in our education communities that if you can't go and partner with a local community, then you know you, you don't have to or you can't do this. And, and um, by and large, that, that's not really true. The, the, the whole idea of you know a three-dimensional Australian curriculum was to really support all educators nationally to be able to embed or incorporate uh, our histories and cultures across all your learning areas and it was to really empower you as an educator to do so and science is no different um, you, you can well and truly um, the 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 inclusions that Akara worked with were done in a generic sense to give you a, a, an opportunity to explore it in your local context, if possible. But if not, there were ideas put forward, and, and no different in this in this text here. You'll see you're being given really detailed information that recognises and respects and attributes who we're talking about, and that is is appropriate for you to share, um, regardless of where you are in Australia. Yeah, and I think we, we're going to say on a slide here in a minute that that involving your, your local community could be seen as the gold, gold uh, standard almost, but not everyone's gonna have that, that ability. So it's really important if we are to meet those commitments in these education declarations um, of ensuring all Australians learn about who we are, that it's, it certainly is a, a job for all educators to um, you know, embed or incorporate aspects relating to us, even if it's at the, the highest level and it, it is at a national level. It, um, you, you may use examples where you, you talk about how Palawa people from Tasmania were doing something, you know, and you might be in, I don't know, in, in Melbourne or something or, or wherever. Um, it's still giving that opportunity to showcase the diversity and, and examples of us. Um, so the big advice here is use a lot of the pre-existing materials that you can find. Um, again, I, I keep telling people to, one of the things that you've got a chance to do is use those, um, uh, content elaborations and, and the cross group priorities that are produced by the Australian curriculum have gone through that process, they've identified the ideas, it's been through a rigorous process. There was an um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander advisory group as part of that work. So you've got some safety there. There's already ideas that have been vetted for you as an outsider to use and give you that, that idea. Um, yeah, so really, you know, use that as your, in this case, as some type of authority. And if, and if someone was to criticise you, you can you can sort of politely say, well, um, I've been following the advice that's been published by the Australian curriculum. Um, yeah, always ensure your practices or cultural narratives uh, um, that, that are non non uh, sacred, not scared. <laughs> that's my fault, I think. Um, use uh, practice cultural uh, use practices or cultural narratives that have been shared by the respective uh, peoples in the open in, in that are out in the open. So find things that are that uh, you can find a person from that particular culture online and uh, in a book or something where they are talking to others about it and sharing that information. You're, you're, you know, you're able, you're not doing something, you're not going back into the 1950s and finding that someone reported to an anthropologist about a particular cultural practice. You know, you, you've just got to, you've got to recognize that there was a, there was a, a privilege and power uh, bias occurring back then. Um, again, showcase science, scientific concepts, don't retell cultural narratives, and um, you know, make sure that, um, that permission has been gained from respective First Nations groups where, where applicable. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and again, creating your own resources. If you do want to go to that level, and I do encourage people where they can to do it, if, you, if you've got a strong interest in this, then one of the ways I, I tell people is to go and contact your local uh, First Nations cultural organisation um, 
uh, you, you'll often see them called Aboriginal corporations and, and things like this. And, and ask them for guidance, say to them, can you put me in touch with someone in the community that has an interest in this? Um, but always be thinking about that as well. If you're asking them to do some work, uh, uh, try and find ways that you could potentially remunerate them for their time. Um, and also, sometimes these communities have an interest to engage with education. And, and I, I often explain that it can be a collaboration where it's not just extractive. We're not just coming up to you and saying, uh, you know, can you tell me how to do this in my classroom and talk about you? To provide them the opportunity and the platform to showcase their mob's ingenuity or whatever it may be. So it's a two-way, a two-way thing, not just uh, us as educators coming and taking. Um, yeah, always check if your local context uh, um, uh, are correct and and respectful. I think it's a, a straightforward. Um, and you know, there's also the opportunity to, to partner and work with your communities when you start doing your your field trips, you know, when you go out into country and field trips, it's a good opportunity to see if local community want to be involved. And they can often give you a, apply a lens to that work that a lot of people don't consider as much and something we should as a nation think more about it as our land tenure shifts. You're seeing more of our communities having control of their traditional lands. Um, so it, it's, and you know, as you see, 21st century scientists is going to start needing to seek uh, permission to go a country to perform science. Then at schools, we should model this as well, and talk and and show this from a, a uh, you know, when we're working in the field, when we're doing field work and so on. Did we get permission to go there? Are there areas within the place we are that we should avoid? Are there things that we should be mindful not to disturb? You know, heritage sites and so on. So again, that was some of that good inclusion in version nine that we're seeing. Uh, and as I said, local community stuff is gold standard. It should not be the it should not be the thing if you can't do it that you don't uh, embed anything about us. So I think it's the big missed message, and I think it's an unfortunate message. It's it really is the gold standard. Yeah, I, I can't. There's over three hundred thousand educators in Australia. There'd be very few people in communities that have the time or the interest in these things, and we're sort of almost going to asking people to bombard these elders or something like this to go do it. It's our job as educators. We, we, we have to do this. I'm not telling you don't engage with local community, but that shouldn't be the be all and, and end all of uh, the embedding of the cross curriculum priority. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, uh, really quickly, have I got time? What do you want me to? Yeah, you we've got, um, Jess, so we've got six minutes. So, um we can either go over a wee bit or we could wrap up at 5 30. Jess? I think we keep rolling. We keep rolling, fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. They can keep watching. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Sorry, for, sorry, sorry for going too. No, too, no, too no. Far. Um uh, so yeah, so one of the people would often come to me and say, Oh, well, you've got this elaboration. How do, what does it look like in a classroom? How, how does it actually look beyond the words on a page? So these are some examples I talked to you very quickly, you know, so again, uh, looking at the, the physics of a, of a spear throw and in year seven, you start looking at things like simple machines and things and you'll see the link there. It, it's remained in version nine uh, in the same way. Sorry, uh, Catherine. Next slide, Catherine. Yep. So, um, so it gives you an, it gives us a chance here to look at well, what's the science of a of a spear thrower? Um, and I'd done some work in an, in another in another role, but you know I'd gone to local community and I was able to take photos of them and 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 so on, film slow mo of people using the technique. People, my family, still using spear throwers, so I've got good access. But I was also able to how would I do this with my own students? And I was able to come up with a, an analogy. So again, I'm avoiding that situation where I'm teaching culture, but I want my students to experience uh, how a lever or a spear thrower works. And so I bought a heap of dog ball throwers, I cut the heads off them and I, and I got some um, wood handles that more uh, make a closer analogy to a spear thrower, a rigid rod. And I put uh, different measures on them and, and then I allowed those students to go out and do some hands-on inquiry using this and they could pose these questions and do their own investigations about the relationship between uh, leverage and and you know either be acceleration or force or distance whatever they whatever they chose in their inquiries to do so next slide um and i was using really simple cheap material a speed gum uh, a golf driving net trundle wheel and those things i made myself 
these spiritual analogies. Next one. Um, and I did this with some teachers who are now using these in their uh, teaching as well. Um, and teachers are um, become just like uh, students. They, they really enjoyed uh, doing these uh, things as well. And some take it too far. Bell on the right there was throwing at about 150 kilometers an hour. So you do need the golf driving net to protect yourself. Um, next one. Yeah, next. Um, you can see. So it was really uh, quite quite easy to do, and, and again, highly engaging for students. Uh, it gives you a chance to click, you know, this first-hand data and so on. Keep going. And this is probably a good example of that gold standard I was talking to you about. And in this case, I was working with some teachers in South Australia, and I was able to reach out to a local elder in the community, Uncle Moogie, and um, we were able to pay Uncle Moogie to come and show us how he uses a... Uh, I think it's a Talia is his name, not injury name for the spear throw, and then and the Kaiki is his reed spears, and uh, all the teachers that I was doing some PD with here all got a got a chance to have a go themselves. Um, but again, um, they were able. We could get people in your community if you're lucky, like in this area. That these some of these teachers got Uncle Mookie to come in, and and they uh, did this with their students as well. My point is here is that's gold standard. You could you can still do everything we did before this point, and then from here you get that ability with the local community, and it wasn't dependent on relying on someone like Uncle Mookie to show up each time and each year and, and so on. We've actually South Australia done some good work here and really uh, doing some good stuff with Uncle Mookie and filming him and being able to then share with Uncle Mookie's permission to share with other teachers. Sorry, keep going, Catherine. Yeah, another, another good context uh, we explored from year four was natural and process materials. So looking at, and looking at it through the context of string, traditional rope or string of cordage. Yep, next. And people are quite surprised to see that uh, a lot of our string is uh, very, very impressive. Um, the Europeans long recognized it was uh, superior rope and string to Europeans um, and made of various plant species depending on what you're using it for, salt water, fresh water or, or, or so on. Uh, next. Um, and again, we can look at the, the science of, of the string. How is it made? How do, you, how do you process it? How do you do it? How do you twist it? How do you apply these, these twists to, to the string? Uh, and then keep going. Um, and then I, I can quickly teach students but not using traditional materials. I can just use raffia that I can buy from Spotlight and I can quickly teach a couple of easy methods that any you know um, student can learn very quickly how to do two-ply string and it, and it works quite well. And then uh, next please. And then we can start tying that connection through into, into I guess uh, some of these STEM, degree, uh, STEM areas and, and careers. Um, here we can look at how um, we can use material science technology, such as a uh, tensometer, to look at how modifying uh, this natural material and processing it uh, changes its properties for a purpose and increases its you know, tensile strength and so on. And we can we do that. And again, highly engaging for, for students that really like uh, to do this. Uh, they learn about our uh, you know, rope technologies, but they're also learning about what this might how we could look at these sorts of biodegradable technologies for, to reduce ghost nets or you know rubbish or, or whatever it may be, but very keen on using the equipment that, that students really enjoy. And you can see on the um, slide, it sort of shows the, the achievement standard. You cover off a lot of the, especially the science inquiry skills when you do these hands-on inquiries, and you get some of obviously the, the this particular science understanding concept covered off as well. Thank you. Uh, same thing here is fire lighting technology. So looking here, remember I said to you before about energy transformations. Um, yeah, we can go next. Um, yeah, so in year eight, we can look at uh, you know, energy in its different forms and how it can be transformed uh, or transferred. Uh, and again, uh, our um, non-secret, non-sacred context of fire lighting technologies are ubiquitous throughout the world. And in Australia, we have lots of different types of um, fire lighting technologies, percussion of rocks, plow methods, saw methods, drill methods, and so on. So we can uh, we can look into into that similar as to the string and similar to the spear thrower. Uh, next, Catherine. 
we can provide the opportunity for people to experience you know the the uh, how they can use technologies like this to transform an energy in this case movement to heat the, the challenge here we're not teaching culture as we keep saying we're not teaching people how to light a fire we're teaching people how to uh, make smoke and they're in their inquiry they come up with the different ways of recording which method do they think was the most efficient at converting at this energy con conversion it's interesting how each some groups come up with a different way of you know making that measure some do heart rate or some use the temperature guns whatever it may be but uh, again works really well in, um, <laughs> Disengage learners often as well. Yeah, nice. But we can keep going, Catherine. Yeah. So again, it's it's about we we've we've seen here we're using the cultural context to drive the teaching of of the science concept. We haven't let the the cultural context derail the teaching of the science. Is the important thing I'd like to tell you. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So I think I'm nearly. I think I'm nearly out. So yeah, uh, take home take home list for you, I guess, is only use reputable materials that have undergone rigorous audits for their appropriateness. I've brought up some of the ones from ACARA, University of Melbourne curricula project, and there should be some more work coming from that as well. Um, IATSIS and and obviously, um, you know, Nelson, I think Catherine will, will talk more about that. Um, yeah, so we, uh, and again, I want you to recognize the, the power of improving engagement by using cultural context. Um, where possible, use culturally con contextualized hands on inquiry. A lot of our, a lot of our learners, uh, we know, do better when it's using you know, learning through place based and hands on learning. Um, and always don't make sure you're teaching the science. Don't don't get lost in the in the in the context. Really keep that explicit connection and clear, because they'll do better when we we start you know um, assessing that and so on. And hopefully we see that improvement in learning science. Uh, where possible, certainly we want you to engage with you, as you said, but don't make that the be all and end all. And the other piece I encourage people is to consider multimodal ways to collect evidence of student learning. And for us, it's especially important. If you go back to closing the gap, you go back to NAPLAN, PISA or TIMS, you'll see we, we often have a literacy lag. Um, and what we need to always be thinking about is how do we make sure that we don't confuse a literacy uh, deficit with a cognitive deficit. So multimodal ways is another thing I'd encourage you to do. I think that's it from me. Thank you so much, Joe. That was um, that was so interesting. And I, I love, I think it's great for um, all the educators online now with us to see all these, just some examples of some of the ways that you can really easily embed um, these First Nations cultures into our into your science teaching. So I'm going to be um, really quick. I just want to just kind of highlight kind of following on from everything that Joe said and I guess showing what we've done here at Nelson um, in terms of the materials that we've developed for this new series of textbooks and how we have basically um, with, you know, working with Joe, we have followed Joe's advice and we have created materials that we believe are really um, a, a big time saver for teachers and are, are very culturally respectful. So, um, so I guess the message here that I would like to share is that we've, you know, we've hand on heart really done our best to do things right. So um, it's something that personally I'm really interested in. I've always found it really interesting and I think it's extremely important. We know it's in the curriculum and teachers need to cover it. Um, and so we working with Joe has been an uh, absolute pleasure and um, it has just has made, it's been a huge learning curve for the whole, the whole publishing house actually and myself personally. Um, and it's just been, it's been a really thorough, rigorous process, very scientific, actually, if using the analogy of science there, um, you know, so we've gone on this journey with Joe and, you know, we've really, um, like talk about kind of, uh, checks and balances, um, really taken care to do a really careful audit. So what's in there is correct and culturally appropriate. So this, um, rather ugly diagram it's not very pretty to look at but it just gives a sense of all the steps that we went through so um a little while back joe talked through some of these things that that you need to look for when you're looking from uh, external materials 
if you're not creating your own materials or what when you're looking for reputable materials what what do we mean by that so and we, this is the steps that we went through in the development and the review of our own materials for this textbook so we just made sure that it was you know in the curriculum that it's um this link to science is very strong that it nothing was sacred or secret um and 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 so on so we've taken all these steps and we've been really careful to ensure that the finished product that teachers are using in their classroom with students um, can be used with confidence and and we are very confident um, that, that that these materials are, are, are appropriate and, and ready to use so the way that we've um, integrated this curriculum into our or in, rather in, integrated this content into our series is we have a module um, in every chapter in most chapters that uh, when there's a relevant aboriginal and torres strait islander um, history cultural um, cross-curriculum priority so you'll see in year seven um that, that in most cases you know five or six of the chapters in each book will have a relevant module and so um we've purposely done it in this way that it's it's embedded in the curriculum it's part of the science content it's not something separate to the rest of the textbook and this was a very deliberate decision and after what you've heard what you've heard what joe has to say on this it, it makes sense that we sit it in with the science content it's not living on its own and so we've really um the content itself is really interesting so it's um it is engaging and it is relevant to the scientific topic so this is just a few examples this is one on chemical and physical changes we've got a few different examples here so there's one on fire fire making techniques one on the use of astronomy in the moon and the sun um, looking at dating methods the other thing that we've really um, that we've really worked hard on these materials is to have a real variety of activities and questions so where possible we've made things hands-on um, we've got some investigations in there we you know we've used there's a lot of variety of um, visual stimuli as well and so not only is the content itself but activities themselves are also really engaging and there's a couple of more examples there so i'm actually going to um you're very welcome to jump into that jam board i'm conscious of time so i'm going to jump over that and actually pass you over to my colleague amanda who's our learning consultant in queensland amanda thanks catherine uh, next slide Hi, I'm Amanda, one of the learning consultants in Queensland. I'm just going to talk to you briefly about Nelson MindTap, which is our courseware that accompanies our excellent textbook. Nelson MindTap is an online learning space where teachers and students access rich content and assignments in a simple, integrated user experience. The content includes digital e-text enriched with multimedia activities and a variety of assessments. We also have amazing twig videos and Fed interactives that can all be accessed anytime, anywhere, and state specific curriculum grids. And you can also integrate this with your LMS. Next slide. Nelson Science Learning Progression Framework underpins the differentiated activities and assessment. Nelson MindTap allows flexible content to create your own teaching plans and rubrics to build the right pathway for your students. The learning path delivers lessons in chunk segments to ensure the students have the right mix of learning content and practicing skills while still being engaged. There are scaffolded open-ended investigations. Differentiated formative assessment will make it easy to cater for all levels of learners. Progressive building with science skills in focus workbooks integrate into integrated into every chapter. All of this is designed to engage your students, but also save you the teacher time in preparation. Next slide. Course customization. So you can create your own course based on the school's topics or priorities. You can customize how you'd like to teach the course. As a teacher, you can customize the course by changing the sequence of the module segments. You have the ability to hide content and reveal it when you're ready to teach it. You can add in links of your own content and arrange it within the learning pathway. And then when you're ready, you can publish your, core, your content. This allows you to create a personalized learner journey based on your students' needs. Next slide. The reading level toggle. This is a great feature in the student 
for uh, the e-text. So there's a read speaker text to speech technology that caters for the differentiated needs of the learner. So this is a great feature for differentiation within our classrooms. We also have the ability to personalize our, our e-text for the teacher and the student. You can do this by um, highlighting the page, making a note, bookmarking, the page and then it can all be saved into what we call study hub and this is a great tool for use for revision or homework uh, or leading up to exams. Next slide. The modified text view. So as you can see on the slide there's a grade level view and also a modified text view. This means the e-text can be viewed by students at a grammatically simplified version but still providing the high level of content. There is also along the way, the word definitions that are highlighted in the right place throughout the text to give it the right context for the students to get the understanding. Next slide. We also have Gradebook. Gradebook is where our assessment feeds into the Gradebook with real-time usage and analytics. Students can track their progress and learning with immediate feedback when they're doing the quizzes. We also offer pre and post section quizzes that provide formative assessment opportunities so that you can assign this to your students as classwork or even as homework. You can differentiate your instruction by creating groups within your class and assigning the work to either the whole class, a group or an individual student. As the teacher, you have full admin rights to your class so you can easily create and edit groups. You can also mark non-marking auto uh, non-marking assessment and you can sync that back to your school's LMS for reporting. Next slide. So this is just giving you a quick look at our covers. So these are our Queensland covers. Next one, our WA covers. And then our pricing. So all of our books will be out uh, for, for years seven and eight will be out by December 2022. There is the option to have a print book, which is $69.95 with Nelson MindTap or there is the option to just have our digital offering, which lasts for 14 months. Obviously year nine and 10 will be coming out in 2023. To access the Nelson MindTap courseware that we've just spoken about, for teachers it's complimentary when a school purchases a class set or book lists the text or the Nelson MindTap digital option as the core text for your subject. When the school adopts the course, we work with the teacher to set the course up and then you can invite your students to the course by use of a course key that we provide you. We offer full teacher training and we'd be only too happy to arrange this well before the books are due for, for adopting schools. Next slide. If you would like to participate in a Nelson MindTap trial of our courseware, we are currently offering a 60 day trial. So if you sign up with one of your, with Nelson before the end of this term, uh, you can get 60, a 60 day trial. This takes in the school holidays. Normally it's only for 30 days. So we've, we've allowed extra time considering our holidays coming up. Also, if you'd like access to our uncorrected page proofs, if you haven't seen them, or if you'd like to book a demo with one of our learning consultants, please contact us at oz.secondary at cengage.com and someone will be, get back to you as soon as possible. Just like to thank you all for taking the time to listen to our, our presentation this evening. And I'd also like to thank Joe and Catherine for giving us some amazing resources and some assistance in better understanding. Thanks. And now it's time for questions. Thanks, everyone. OK, so I can see one question is answering. <laughs> He's typing an answer. Joe, um, how about I'll, if it's OK, I'll read it out. You could maybe share the response. Okay, um, so someone said, in regards to Year 7 Earth and Space, looking at astronomy, for example, Emu in the Sky and other stories regarding the formation of constellations, is there a way of incorporating these in lessons by linking the science and not simplifying or just retelling the story? And any examples, or would you believe, or do you think we should avoid these scenarios? Um, Jay, you're on mute at the moment, so you'll just need to unmute. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> story of my life. Um, uh, no, I think it's a very good uh, opportunity. I think it's one of those cultural narratives that lends itself well. It's uh, certainly out in the public domain. Uh, um, the, the Dark Emu um, 
is well known across many groups. It's not just one one group, um, and that's part of the learning. Almost you could look at some of that, and I don't think you'll have any trouble finding uh, published material by respective traditional owners uh, telling their own stories. Uh, certainly, one that comes to mind is uh, dinner one uh, stories about um, the dark emu. Um, yeah, I think it's a good, and you can do some. Uh, also, point out um, you know some of the similarities that astronomy is uh, something important to all peoples of the world and also the that uh, for a lot of first nations australians there's certainly this recognition of you know our constellations that are familiar like the seven sisters that most people have heard of the pleiades and so on um but also that the dark spaces in between is something that probably distinguishes it as something that the dark emu is called the dark emu because it's not necessarily uh, based on a constellation that's that area in the coal sack so no, no, my, my, my quick answer to that is that's a very good example of saying what I often do is in, uh, try as an educator is to privilege the voice of the people so if you can put you know play a video of, a, of an elder describing the constellation or, or show some text or get people to read some text that has been authored by someone from that cultural group that's how I normally would uh, address that Okay, thank you. And we don't have any more questions at this time. So we're going to wrap up. Um, and we've had some great feedback from the chat. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> and a big thank you to the Nelson team for presenting and a super big thank you to Jared for coming and sharing with us tonight. Thanks. And a big thank you to the audience. I know this was a long one, but I really hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you and good night.